And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and it is my great honor once again to welcome each and every one of you into the Puritan Barn to the Now You See TV studios for the Midnight Ride with myself and John Pounders. Tonight, when angels deserve to die, we're taking a deep dive into the 69th chapter of the Book of Enoch to dig deep into the angelic hierarchy to found, explore secrets that have been buried for literally thousands of years. So get ready. It all starts right now because we are now live, live, live. What's up, guys? It's so good to be here once again in the Puritan Barn. And I want to let I want to let you guys know that we are so grateful that you have chosen your time to spend with us this Saturday night. And we want to ask that each one of you just tell us where you guys are from. Uh, give us a thumbs up. And thank you guys so much for um, really just being there to be a light to the people around the world. And um, tonight we want to give a shout out to our sponsors, Joshua Watts Leather. Um, great custom leather pieces. I mean, you can, he can make your books look like they came out of antiquities. Just amazing stuff. Um, bracelets custom leather pieces gun holsters you name it uh he makes them so make sure you guys check him out he's been a sponsor of ours for a long time the link's in the description sugar and spice soap company natural soaps soaps that you do not have to worry about putting toxic chemicals on your body in the world we live in now trusting the companies that make our soaps these big multi-million billion dollar companies uh as proven to be very dangerous in the least so we want to Check out natural soap companies, also clean soap companies. You don't have to worry about rubbing things unclean on your body. And for you guys, you get a 10% off of any of your order with the NYSTV coupon. And you can get the Midnight Ride Soap, which is really, really cool. They have a soap package for all you Midnight Riders out there or anything else that you guys decide to get on there. Check that out. FOJC Radio, uh, which is David and Donna Carico's ministry work that they've been doing for 40-plus years. Tons of materials on there, tons of videos, tons of just uh, books, everything that you could need to uh, kind of further your um, relationship with the Father. And uh, also, we want to give a shout-out to nystv.org. It's our website where we have all of our stuff that is um, – unplayable by youtube and by other places like that also you know just too hot for to be able to put on there we have book of enoch video commentary documentaries that you won't find anywhere else and for those of you that want to check it out you can get eight dollars and 99 cents off your first month with the coupon code rider that's r-i-d-e-r -E and so we'd appreciate it you guys check out those links below and so that's enough of that david you got anything else you want to say well uh we will have an internet radio broadcast this sunday we're not going to be on youtube or rumble it will be on fojc radio at 8 p.m brett graham is going to bring a lesson on soul winning extremely important topic and i want to give a shout out to sister donna this this monday she will have been married 43 years well, happy anniversary to me happy anniversary. so there you go awesome. happy anniversary sister donna 43 years, man. You don't see that a lot anymore. No, no, you don't. 
Uh, a couple more things I just did forget about. We are doing a meet and greet in Nashville, and it's going to be at the Golden Crown Nashville. There's a registration site on the link here below. Um, it's going to be packed out. Like I think that we we were going to have to call the place and tell them that it literally might we might pack out their entire place because hundreds of you have already registered to come to that thing in Nashville. So we're looking forward to it. If you know if we have to, we'll part of us will we'll go outside for part of it. I think it's supposed to be a nice day out there. So we're looking forward to that. For those of you who want to come, check out the details are in uh, the description below with that link. Um, also, one more thing, David. I know that we're we're running running through in here, but I think people need to know about this. So tomorrow, uh, John is sick. He's so he's not going to be able to do the show tomorrow. But I'm having a lawyer on tomorrow, um, and this is the discussion is going to be on Rumble because it's going to be something that I think that um, may be too hot for YouTube because we're going to be talking about how what people can do to fight back against the school system and the content that they're allowing children to see, and it's a very practical way to do it, very cheap way to do it. And if we can get enough people on board to do it, it could really cripple the uh, system in a way that is, would send shockwaves throughout the entire world. So hopefully that will uh, you guys will check that out, because for those of you that have children in the public school, this could be a great option for you. And if it's if you don't, you could at least share it with people that do. So tomorrow on AAC TV, I'll let you guys know where the link will be. So make sure to stay tuned for that. So other than that, David, that's all I got. Well, man. I'm praise God for now. that. Will that be at the six o'clock time? Slot? That'll, that'll be at the six all o'clock right, time. On. slot. Okay, well, that is fantastic. Yeah. That is so needful. Yeah. I mean, that is just so needful. So yeah. I'm just so thankful for that. Yeah, amen. Well, David, let's uh, let's get us on the road, man. I'm excited to hear about this topic. This is one of my mo the one of the most interesting chapters to me in the Book of Enoch is Enoch chapter 69 because it tells a story that was otherwise unknown um, when until you see it. And just no brag, just fact, as Walter Brennan would say. If you're not listening to FOJC or Now You See TV, you're not going to hear this. Yeah. I've never heard anyone else ever teach this of you, John. No, I haven't. I actually never have. I remember when we found this, I think it was in 2016, when we decided we started putting it together. Yeah. Uh, we have never heard it before. In fact, you can't really find any commentary on it, it doesn't seem like. So, yeah, you know. we've talked about it and revisited several times. And I mean, and I'm, I'm thankful, but this is important material. Yeah. And I am thankful that we're able to present it to y'all. And this is uh, the last uh, two weeks ago, we laid the foundation in Enoch chapter 69 with the understanding that there are two seraphim listed in the scripture. We can identify Satan and the Assyrian, and we can identify five more in the book of Enoch for seven fallen seraphim. And they are called Satan's. In the book of Enoch, it, we read the text last week. The book of Enoch talks about Satan and the other Satans that are in subjection to Satan. And here in Enoch chapter 69, they are presented as the ruling class over all of the angels. And over and over, every time I find new truths and insight in the book of Enoch, my mind goes back to the very first verse of the book of Enoch where it says that the things in the book of Enoch are for God's people in the end time tribulation and I just have to think and I know and I believe in my heart that all of these things are important for us to know so we're going to do our due diligence to study and see what we can see in these texts in Enoch chapter 69 and verse 4 and we're going to be going through the five other Satans as I said, we've got two Satans, Satan and the Assyrian, and Satan, a.k.a. Seraphim. And we have two in Scripture. We have five here in Enoch, and we're going to look at these five that are said in the book of Enoch to be in subjection to Satan, yet as the chief over all of the other angelic hierarchy. We're at the top of the angelic food chain here. And there are seraphims that fell, and there are seraphims that did not fall. Most of them did not, thank God. So we'll read the text in Enoch 69 and 4. The name of the first, Jaquan, that is, the one who led astray all the sons of God and brought them down to the earth and led them astray through the daughters of men. So, 
the insight that comes from the book of Enoch is that, you know, the angels just didn't decide one day, well, we're going to go down and fornicate with women. But this idea was put into their mind. This idea was put into their mind by the very top of the angelic hierarchy. And as we looked at the text last week, even the angels that uh, did not fall, they were hesitant even to punish these fallen angels because the, the punishment was so horrific that it was just overwhelming. But it was an amazing thing that they had to do in actually uh, having an angel to transform their body to where they could come down and meet, mate with human women. And there was a problem, too, with the women. And uh, there were things that, uh, you know, many of these women died that gave birth to these monsters because we know from Genesis chapter 6, when the angels mated with human women, it produced giants. And many of these women died in childbirth. And if common sense will tell you, that any woman would die from birthing something this size. And for a woman to survive the birth of one of these entities, she would have had to have undergone genetic change just to be able to survive the birth. There's a very interesting text here in the Kebron Nagast, which is a text, uh, it's an Egyptian text, and it says this on page 184 of the Kebron Nagast. And the daughters of Cain, with whom the angels had companied, conceived. But they were unable to bring forth their children, and they died. And of the children who were in their wombs, some died, and some came forth. Having split open the bellies of the mothers, they came forth by their navels. And when they were grown up and reached man's estate, they became giants whose height reached unto the clouds. And in the Kebra Nagast, it's just like uh, the picture you get is huge giants, huge giants, much like the text we have in Scripture that says that um, the, the Anakim, they reach to the height of the cedars. Now, in Enoch chapter 19 and 2, there's not much said about the women Nephilim, but there's a, a lot said in Scripture and non-canonical text about them. And in Enoch 19 and 2, it says, And the women also, the angels, who went astray, became sirens. Now, this implies something. That, you know, there were many women, who, and some of the women were raped. And, uh, you know, the Lord did not hold that against them. But there's also a lot of texts that would indicate that there were women that were very willing to go along with this. And to be able to survive a birth of this magnitude, genetic alteration, by common sense, it would have just been necessary. And the book of Enoch tells us that these women who submitted to this and went forth genetic alteration became sirens. And there's all kind of pictures of sirens and traditions. Uh, the one on the left there, is pictured as a, a chimera, a, a siren, half woman, uh, half animal, uh, twin tailed sirens, all kinds of abnormalities. Of, there's just a laundry list of these um, female Nephilim type creatures. We have the mermaid and on and on and on. Lilith is one of the most, promise, uh, most prominent stories of these female Nephilim. And this was the result, and, and many of these were just born. You know, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, they had male and female children. And some of these women who became the leader in the dark realm, such as Lilith, these, according to the book of Enoch, were these women that submitted themselves under this uh, genetic alteration to save their life. There's this Animal Planet episode in Egypt, there's a cave that has these drawings in the cave, and it's humans fighting tailed creatures. And Animal Planet suggests that either it's possible this is one of the oldest drawings depicted, and it's they believe that it's possibly showing a historical account of humans either killing off the mermaids or driving them into hiding. 
And it's really interesting um, account there in that cave. I, I just, I don't know if you saw that or not, but that was one of the things that I researched after seeing that you had this in the slides. No, no, I did not. And there's actually a quote from Pliny the Elder. And Pliny the Elder, who was a Roman historian, he was contemporary with Moses. And there is a, he has the letter in there from, uh, from a governor or from a mayor of a city that was claiming that it was like 70 mermaids had died and had washed up on the shore. Huh. And wow. these, uh, yeah, and he just give it as a straightforward history account. For some reason, they all yeah. died, and they just had washed up on the sea. And yeah. he just wrote, was writing like a report of these, uh, these creatures just washing up there. And yeah. there is multitudes of historical accounts that these were indeed real creatures. And I and more and more we're seeing more crazy stuff every day we live, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna see more and more of this type of thing. I would imagine too that once humans got to a point where weaponry was at its high point, where we could you know shoot harpoon guns, shoot pistols, guns, whatever into the water, missiles, uh, they they started to meet their match and probably went into hiding. If if these creatures, which I believe the scriptures to be true. Mm -hmm truly exists they are in hiding right now because i guarantee you that over the last few hundred years there's been a lot of rednecks over the last few hundred years that hunted down these giants and and even the hebrews the hebrews slayed the the anunnaki completely slayed them and cut them down so interesting yeah and even um in the uh in the scriptures it talks about esau that he even drove the uh the giants out of mount seer he was a giant yeah. hunter and then he was so stupid that he intermarried with them, you yeah. know. I mean, what was he thinking? Yeah. But yeah, but they were they were hunted just like uh, um, in the the inheritance in Canaan. They declared war on them, wow. and uh, I think they're a little sore about that, looking for a little payback. Um, Second Esther's five and eight speaks to this same situation. Uh, there shall be a confusion also in many places, and the fire shall be off sent out against and the wild beasts shall change their places and menstruous women shall bring forth monsters and it's interesting here when we read later on um, some of the texts that it was menstruous women that brought forth monsters and this is the book of second estrus is a fascinating book that i give a lot of credibility to it was in the king james apocrypha and Second Esther's chapter five is such a profound chapter; it's worth reading in its totality, and it would even be worth unpacking in its totality. Now, there's some hints in Scripture of just exactly how this this took place. In Jude chapter six, it says, "And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains." under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. And that word there, translated habitation, is translated in Second Corinthians 5 and 2 of our house, which is from heaven, the same word. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven, or our glorified body that we will receive. So there's a correlation drawn between the angel, and literally they left their bodies. They left their habitation. The same word in 2 Corinthians 5 and 2 used of the glorified body of the believer. So they had a permanent out-of-the-body experience, so to speak, and they totally uh, burned their bridges behind them, so to speak. And in Luke 24, 39, we can really see just exactly what kind of body they have. It says, Jesus said, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Jesus, after his resurrection, had a flesh and bone body. He shed his blood, every last drop of it. And in the book of Genesis, it's very interesting. Uh, after the creation of Eve, the scripture says, Adam said, she is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You know, we would say flesh and blood, but he didn't say that. And I don't believe that 
before the fall, I don't believe Adam and Eve had blood in their body. But I think after the fall, this is when that began to transpire. One of the big theories, too, with all that, too, David, which is really, you know, I think once I say it, you guys will understand why, but is the idea of the bodies of light before uh, the they had the regular bodies. But the reason I don't think that theory holds true is because it literally says that God formed Adam from the dirt of the ground mm-hmm. and breathed life into him. So that doesn't sound like a body of light to me, but uh, definitely the flesh and bone body is so is such an interesting thing. I, th- I remember doing a show with David about the life in the blood yeah. and narrowing down. And, it's, and there's so much symbology in that that it's just amazing. And, you know, life is what blood is what gives us life. Yeah. But also blood is what causes us to die. Yeah. And it causes our bodies to grow old and decay and to one day pass from this world. Yeah. But it you can just get an ironclad comparison here that most definitely the uh, angels have a flesh and bone body just like Jesus. And you, it'll also be like our resurrection body. Jesus told us here in Luke 20, 35 and 36, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry or nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God being the children of the resurrection. So in the resurrected state, we're going to be equal to the body of the angels, which is going to be a flesh and bone body that will be capable of some really amazing things. Jesus was there, and uh, they were gathered together in a room with the doors shut, and Jesus just just shows up in their midst. I bet he got a kick out of scaring them, I kind of bet. Yeah. He got a kick out of that. But there's going to be some amazing things in the resurrection, in that resurrection body. And, you know, the the idea, and, you know, like, in we're going to be looking a little bit at the book of Adam and Eve, And in those books and in these texts, they do, like John said, they present the idea of a glorious body. There are several non-canonical texts that do that. But we cannot hold these texts to Scripture. What we can look at, we can look at these books for some old traditions and stories that are, are very interesting. We're going to look at a couple of them tonight, but we cannot hold them to level Scripture. And like John said, this doesn't hold water. You know, the idea of all the conclusions from Scripture is that there was a flesh and bone body of Adam and Eve um, before the fall. Yep. And we're made in the image of God, which is an interesting mm-hmm. thing to understand. You know, we are literally made to look like God, which is different from the, all the other angels. All the other angels we know look like reptiles and look like um something you see in a in a movie, right? They look they look different, but the image of God is is what we're made of it's amazing yeah it absolutely is now in enoch chapter 69 and verse 5 we meet the second uh satan asbeel and the name asbeel means the one who forsakes god and it says of asbeel and the second was named asbeel he imparted to the holy sons of god evil counsel that led them astray so that they defiled their bodies with the daughters of men. And I, you know, I try to figure out, well, what would be the difference between what Jaquan did and what Asbeel did? And it seems like the, the counsel of Asbeel, it got down to the nuts and bolts of the nitty gritty of what they had to do to carry forth this impregnation. And it talks about in the scripture, we read the text, and I might give a little warning here. We're for the youngsters. If you have uh, youngsters here, some of this material is, you know, uh, you you might just want to have your little ones go out because even to be able to talk about this in the most G-rated sense is kind of disturbing because we're talking about disturbing stuff. This is when angels did uh, deserve to die. They went, they run through all the stop signs, and they did. They burned the bridges behind them, and they deserved to die because of the things they did in attempting to destroy and corrupt the human genome. 
Now, in this text in Enoch chapter 15 and verse 4, it says, And though ye were holy, spiritual, living the eternal life, you have defiled yourselves with the blood of women. Now, we get a very specific indication here in the book of Enoch what this specific defilement took place in. And we are, we're dealing with satanic rituals and satanic magic that was bringing forth this. Now, could you go back just for a I'm minute sorry, to this yep. other text? Um, uh, we'll, we'll just read the rest of this. They defiled themselves with the blood of women and have begotten children with the blood of flesh. Now, as you say, we were talking about the life being in the blood and using the female blood and it's interesting also in the text in estrus it was menstruous woman that brought forth these monsters there was the use of this blood in satanic ritual to bring about this act because this was an unnatural act in every sense of the word this was unnatural they they begotten children with the blood of flesh and as the children of men have lusted after flesh and blood as those also do who die and perish. So we have something very specific being pointed to, and it was Asbeel, this one that forsook God, that imparted unto them this satanic knowledge. And it's a, um, it, it's the concept behind, uh, well, and I'll just read a little of this text from Lawrence Gardner. And we have here the beginning of what we could call the seed war. The seed of the woman versus the seed of Satan. And they, they wanted to preserve a pure bloodline through the, the intermingling of the satanic rites. And I, I'll just read a little bit. Lawrence Gardner is a fellow that was privy to um, all of the elite libraries in Europe, Masonic and private. And he says a lot of things that nobody ought to know, really. But he talks about the starfire. And uh, he talks about the preservation of this bloodline. It's the Anunnaki bloodline that, from the most ancient of times, they wanted to preserve this genetic element of the fallen angels within the race of human beings. And they were so careful the way that they intermingled and the way they, the steps they took to genetically enhance this fallen angel DNA, it was a really big deal. And we can see this preserved throughout the royal houses of Europe. We can see it uh, through the Merovingians. And you can see a lot of the pictures. <laughs> if, if you ever look at the pictures, a lot of these British royal lines, they would marry brothers and sisters to keep the bloodline going. And you have some really strange looking people in some of these paintings. <laughs> uh, they pray to, paid a price for marrying a uh, brother and sister together, which of course is also against scripture. But Mr. Gardner says this, he says the original starfire nectar of Mesopotamia, often called the plant of birth, was fed to the kings of the early grail bloodlines until about 1960 BC. The minstrel flower, she who flows, was the designated flower. Minstrum contains the most valuable endocrine secretions, particularly those of the pineal and pituitary glands, which heighten the qualities of intuition, awareness, and perception. Now, here we begin to get into the concept of adrenal chrome. That And there's a statement he makes on the next page, and he talks about how that people try to reproduce this in organic compounds. And he says the difference uh, is that today's supplements are obtained from the desiccated glands of dead animals. And as pointed out by some while ago by Kenneth Grant, outer head of the Ordo Templar, Templar Orientis, they lack the truly important elements which exist only in live human glandular function. And there are many unspeakable things that are said about the, the adrenal chrome. And you know, you, you, you just wonder, you just wonder, like, 
not mentioning any names, but our beloved president, Joe Biden. And sometimes he can't put two words together. And there are other times where he seems just tremendously lucid. So I just got to wonder what's going on, to, to what they're shooting old Joe up with to keep him going. But this is something that has been done uh, for thousands of years. These people that are these bloodline people, they believe that this is what gives them power. This is what gives them added intelligence and awareness. And this is what they do to preserve the purity of this fallen angel bloodline. And even the ability to do this, it comes from fallen angel knowledge. It comes from black magic rites that were passed down from these first two Satans that we see from Jaquan and Asbeel. Now, in Enoch 69, 6 and 7, we see our third Satan. His, his name is Gadriel. And many, uh, and well, not many, but the few that you ever hear teach on this, and they will take this book, and this verse, and they will cherry pick it, and they'll say that Gadriel is Satan. And this is far from what the book of Enoch teaches. The book of Enoch clearly teaches that these Satans are in submission to Satan, the big guy. He's the big guy. And we gave a couple texts on that last week. But we'll unpack this a little bit. This is, uh, opens up some fascinating concepts. It uh, says, And the third was named Gadriel. He it is who showed the children of men all the blows of death, and he led astray Eve and showed all the weapons of death to the sons of men, the shield and the coat of mail, and the sword for battle, and all the weapons of death to the children of men. And from his hand they have proceeded against those who dwell on the earth from that day and forevermore. Now, we'll look at some text in a book that we use judiciously. This is the book of Adam and Eve, which um, cannot be held in any way to the standard of Scripture, but yet, because of its antiquity, it is a book that holds ancient traditions that we can find echoed in other non-canonical literature about the, the life of Adam and Eve. And wouldn't it be great, you know, and when it talks about Gad Real uh, leading astray Eve, it wasn't talking about the episode that we see in Scripture uh, that we know of Eve being tempted uh, by Satan, but it was a later episode as is recorded here in the book of Adam and Eve. Wouldn't it be great if we all only messed up one time? Wouldn't that be neat? Is there just nobody like that? And that was the way Eve was also. She didn't just mess up one time, but she me messed up more times. And there was what was referred to in this literature, we'll see, referred to as the second transgression. But let's read a little bit of this text from the book of Adam and Eve. It's very compelling. It says, in 18 days past, then Satan with wrath and transformed himself into the brightness of angels and went away to the river. Went away to the river Tigris to eat and found her weeping and the devil himself pretended to grieve with her. And he began to weep and said to her, come out of the river and lament no more. Cease now from sorrow and moans. Why art thou anxious? And thy husband Adam the Lord God hath heard your groanings and hath accepted your penitence, and all we angels have entreated on your behalf and made supplication to the Lord. And he hath sent me to bring you out of the water and give you the nourishment which you've had in paradise and for which you are crying. Now, I don't know what Satan gave her to eat, but uh, I bet it wasn't any good for her. Now, in Chapter 10 and verse 1 of the book of Adam and Eve, it goes on to say, But Eve heard and believed and went out of the water of the river, and her flesh was trembling. In verse 3 and 4, it says, And when Adam had seen her and the devil with her, he wept and cried aloud and said, O Eve, Eve, where is the labor of thy penitence 
how hast thou been again ensnared by our adversary? See, we're looking here at a second ensnarement of Eve. Why hast thou again been ensnared by our adversary, by whose means we have been estranged from our, from our abode in paradise and spiritual joy? In 18 and 1, it says, And Eve said to Adam, Live thou, my Lord, to thee life is granted, since thou hast committed neither the first nor the second error. This is the second error. And this is echoed in other literature that uh, there was a second error. And according to the book of Enoch, this is what's attributed to Gad Real, who, of course, was under the, um, under the rule of Satan. But I have erred and been led astray, for I have not kept the commandment of God, and now banish me from the light of thy life, and I will go to the sun setting. Now, it's interesting here in this tradition what they did. Uh, it says in 36 and 1, And Adam said to Eve, Rise up and go with my son Seth to the neighborhood of paradise, and put dust on your heads and throw yourselves to the ground and lament in the sight of God. Now, there's a tradition here in the Book of Adam and Eve and another non-canonical literature that Adam and Eve would go back to the door of paradise. They were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, and they would go back to the door where they were thrown out, you know, and they would go there, and the tradition has it in this non-canonical literature that they literally was a place of worship there. And we're going to see some echoes of that in the Word of God that perhaps the very first worship assembly that was ever set up was right at the door of paradise where Adam and Eve were thrown out. In uh, chapter 40 and 1, it says, But Seth and his mother walked to the regions of paradise for the oil of mercy to anoint the sick Adam. And they arrived at the gates of paradise, and they took the dust from the earth and placed it on their heads and bowed themselves with their faces to the earth and began to lament. Now, in Scripture, there's a text here that could give credibility that in all of these non-canonical texts that talk about Adam and Eve going back to the very place they got thrown out to worship, that there might be something to it. Now, in this text in Genesis 4 and 7, if thou doest well, thou shalt not be, excuse me, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, that where it says there, sin lieth at the door, that Hebrew word is shatah, and that Hebrew word shatah can mean either sin or sin offering. And I believe what that text is saying when it says sin lieth at the door is there is a sin offering at the door of paradise. The way of redemption and the way of salvation was provided for Adam and Eve. And I believe this is exactly what it's saying, that right there at the gates of paradise, there's a sin offering for you if you will accept it and be repentant and walk with me in faith. Now, it's interesting, the same is true in the Greek. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, For he hath made him to be no sin, excuse me, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And that word there, sin, Jesus was not made sinful. And this is what the people in the Word of Faith movement will teach, is Kenneth Copeland goes so far to say that Jesus took on the nature of Satan upon the cross. Marilyn Hickey says that on the cross, it says, well, Jesus got every disease. He had chicken pox. He had everything, you know, and they just, you know, bless their hearts. <laughs> they just don't have a clue. But that's what it means in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He didn't become sinful, Kenny, but he was her sin offering. And this is the same in the Hebrew. It's the same in the Greek, that it can mean sin or sin offering now in enoch uh chapter 69 8 through 11 and we'll look at another very 
interesting uh, Satan here, panume. And literally, that word means the face of death. Panume, the face of death. And the fourth was named Panume. He taught the children of men the bitter and the sweet, and he taught them all the secrets of their wisdom. And he instructed mankind in writing with ink and paper, and thereby many sinned from eternity to eternity until this day. For men were not created for such a purpose to give confirmation to their good faith with pen and ink. That's the key to understanding this. Confirming to give confirmation to their good faith with pen and ink. For men were created exactly like the angels to the intent that they should continue pure and righteous and death which destroys everything could not have taken hold of them but through this their knowledge they are perishing and through this power it is consuming me. Now, let's look at a text here in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. And this is literally uh, the, the thing that Panume introduces them to, uh, to the knowledge of good and evil. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. From the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, we'll get a little help here from Nicholsburg commentary in the book of Enoch. I think he really nails it here. And it's interesting. We're going to look at a video here in just a little bit about an amazing stone that was found on top of Mount Hermon that actually contains the oath of the fallen angels. It's pretty amazing. And the fellow that translated this stone we're going to show you was Mr. Nicholsburg here that did the commentary in the book of Enoch. He was quite a bright fellow. But in his commentary on the book of Enoch, um, he says this. I'll make sure. Okay. He says, perhaps the author has in mind a particular abhorrent kind of religious writing. And this is indeed what he has in mind. And just like in the scripture, uh, the Bible talks against giving oaths. And Jesus said, let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay. And it was never meant. And all the way back here in the book of Enoch, you know, there's the time we talk about the time when a man's word was his, was good. And uh, if you had their word in a handshake, you didn't need a written contract. Well, those days are gone forever, aren't they? But it's talking about the ungodliness of having to confirm your good intentions in writing, that people's words should be valid. And this is borne out in the scripture in the book of Enoch in chapter 98 and verse 15. And it says, Woe to you who write down lying and godless words, for they write down their lies that men may hear them and act godless towards their neighbor. And we have the same thing here, the implication of a broken oath. That people, I tell you there's some people, bless their heart, uh, they say they're believers, but when they say they're going to do this or that, <laughs> you just know that, uh, about how much their word is worth. You know, and our word should be good. And when people say they're going to do something, they should do it. And it goes on here, another comment here from Mr. Nicholsburg. He says, thus, according to the present passage, one need not affirm one's word by writing down what one says. In the analogy, one need not affirm one's word with an oath. This seems to be the simplest and most straightforward interpretation of verse 10 and I think Mr. Nicholsburg nails it and that is just exactly what he's talking about now we'll see here that this also comes to the very act that the fallen angels did it says and they all answered him and said let us swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then swear they all together 
and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And that by mutual imprecations, that means that something bad will happen to if you don't do it. And um, we're going, and the, the idea and the, the full drama of what was taking place here. I mean, these angels left their heavenly bodies. They really deserved to die. They went to, they went and done things that could never be reversed. And they swore an oath together never to go back, but to fulfill this plan to destroy the human genome. And the, the, the plan that to destroy human genetics and to corrupt them, this was a specific plan sworn by an oath the very highest elite of the satanic spiritual hierarchy swore an oath and conceived angels deceived angels who swore an oath to be committed to this this is a plan and we can still see the ramifications of this plan uh working themselves out but believe it or not believe it or not we also have evidence here we're going to play a little video for you there was a fellow by the name of Charles Warren, who was a British explorer. He actually found on top of Mount Hermon a plaque that was inscribed that could very well be the original oath that the fallen angels swore. Interestingly enough, Mr. Charles Warren went on to be the investigator in England during the Jack the Ripper murders. So we're just going to play a little bit of this for you. And to me, this is just absolutely amazing that uh, the very oath and the, the plaque to commemorate it might actually have been found here by Mr. Warren. But we'll just let you take a look at this. As part of his duties, Warren surveyed the old city and the Temple Mount and in 1867 surveyed a spring that provided fresh water to the Bronze Age and Iron Age of Jerusalem. And in 1869, on behalf of the Palestinian Exploration Fund, Sir Charles climbed up the forbidding sides of Mount Hermon to determine its true height and describe any archaeological sites found there. As such, Warren explored, measured, and sketched an ancient temple known as Khazar Antar. Here, he passed through the temple and continued upwards along the peak in a strange anti-clockwise spiral pattern in order to reach the summit. The southern peak's rocky terrain had appeared to have been scooped out and what appeared to be sacrificial altars to ancient gods of the mountain. Fascinated and confused at the same time, Warren explored and surveyed the area, documenting much of what he found. He then discovered within the area a strange stele, which is a stone pillar, otherwise known as a tablet, engraved on one side in an ancient language, the closest being ancient Greek. Before leaving the summit, Warren chose to remove the marker and carry it down the 9,000 foot height for transfer to London, but being four feet thick and far heavier than his team could manage, he ordered the stone to be sliced in half to reduce its thickness and weight, and although the lighter weight did make the trip down the mountain much easier, the ancient stone suffered as a result, cracking horizontally along its midsection. Upon returning it to the British Museum, it was then later inspected by scholars and translators, and the writing on the stone appeared to have a phrase they can make out, and it read this, According to the command of the greatest and most holy God, those who take the oath proceed from here. Now it was debated if the translation was 100% accurate due to the damage done by the splitting of the stone, and debates on its translation due to it being what they described as ancient Greek, but the translation of the stone roughly stayed the same. Strangely enough, any photographs of the temple of Khazar Antar are almost non-existent. In fact, the photos that exist from the exploration were extremely hard to come by, and they are very limited, and the site of the temple documented by Warren is now sealed off by the UN building that sits there today and no modern photographs or videos exist. 
However, Warren did manage to draw a schematic of the temple, as shown here. The marker is currently housed at the British Museum, listed as item number 1903-0422-1, but is told it is no longer displayed to the public for unknown reasons. I'll tell you something interesting that I saw on that, David, that really struck my interest is these letters on this on this would look like English letters. They don't look like the old phonetic or Phoenician language or the old Hebrew language that we're used to seeing as one of the oldest depictions of language. This, they said it looks like Greek letters, but it looks like English letters. Yeah. 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 And of course the entrance to this is sealed off by the UN building <laughs> that's down on the top of Mount Hermon. And of course they pulled this so no one can look at it. And the whole temple there, what it looked like to me, it had the circle appearance of a portal. And like a lot of the pictures that you can see of the poles, that it, the, the hole in the middle that you can see uh, on the poles, it looked very much like to that and a portal. Yeah. And uh, what else would we expect there from Mount Hermon? But, you know, as I say, you just can't make this, this up. And I think it's quite likely, you know, they that don't take the oath proceed from here. You know, because it was a definitive plan for these fallen ones to um, destroy the human genome. And that plan is still being executed with the greatest of diligence and foresight. Yeah. Now, let's look what Jesus said. Matthew 5, 33. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform to the Lord thine oath. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. And this was the intent that we see um there in the book of Enoch that the the practices of men in this way were not pleasing unto God. Now, our good friends, the Freemasons, they are the champions at uh, taking oaths. And we'll just read uh, a couple of the oaths here. Uh, this I'll read this. This is from um, Lester's Look to the East. It's a Masonic monitor. And in the very first degree, uh, there are so many blood-curdling oaths in Freemasonry, it would make your, uh, your hair stand on end, so to speak. And uh, there's even in the Scottish Rite, they go so far as to use the word Abaddon as the secret word. That's in the 17th degree of the Scottish Rite, the Knights, the East, and the West. And it says here, this is the very first in the Fellowcraft degree, it says, all this I most solemnly and sincerely promise and swear with a firm and steadfast resolution to keep and perform the same without the least equivocation, mental reservation, or self-evasion whatsoever, binding myself under no less penalty than that of having my left breast torn open and my heart plucked from thence and given to the beast of the field. <laughs> now that's one of the milder ones, it really is. It just gets more graphic from there. And in a text here, I'll read one from uh, Duncan's Ritual of Freemasonry. And this is in the, um, uh, the seventh degree of the Royal Arch, a degree of the York Rite. And it says here, uh, the, the secret word is Jabba Line the God that they worship and swear by in this degree. And they even explain to you what it means. Yah, the name of God found in the 68th Psalm, Baal or Bel, this word signifies a Lord or Master. And An, this was the name by which Jehovah was worshipped among the Egyptians. No, he wasn't. <laughs> no, he wasn't. And they are putting together their Mr. Um, 
their chimera three-headed god here blaspheming god by uniting the name of jehovah with baal and osiris and this is ranked blasphemy and uh, you know freemasons can they can say what they want to say but this is the rankest of idolatry and from the very first degree prayers are off offered up to other gods oaths are sworn to pagan deities and uh, these are performed with the rituals of ancient Egypt and Babylon. This is just an unbelievable godly mess. And how people, and I, I think they know better. They just try to justify this in their mind, but uh, they know better. This is wrong, and this is unscriptural. And they will pay the price for it, just like the fallen angels that swore their original oath. They will pay, uh, they'll pay a price for it at the bar of God. Now, in this book here, the Testament of Abraham, there's evidence that comes forth that we've seen before of death being spoken of in a person. And we've looked at this in Scripture on previous Midnight Rides, and we've looked at this in uh, the, the war between the, the Nephilim War we called the One Midnight Ride. And this is another confirming voice here in the Testament of Abraham that shows the concept of how uh, the, the ancient peoples understood death to be an entity. We have death and we have hell, and this is indeed an entity. But I'll read just a little bit of the Testament of Abraham here in the 18th chapter. It says, And when the all-holy Abraham saw these things, he said to death, I beg you, all-destroying death, hide your ferocity and put on the youthful beauty and form which you previously had. Death immediately hid his ferocity and put on his youthful beauty which he had previously had. Abraham said to death, Why did you do this, that you killed all my male and female servants? Was it for the sake of this that God sent you here today? And death said, No, my Lord Abraham, it is not as you say, rather, I was sent here for you. Okay. But it's interesting uh, text, and again, we can't press this uh, to a high degree of scriptural credibility, but it preserves these traditions that are echoed in many. We see it in scripture, and we see it in many of these old writings, the understanding that when it talked about death and hell, that this was an entity. And this is, it says this about the god Mott. It said the word literally means death from the Ugardic. The texts describe him as always hungry for human beings. He was a fierce and long-term enemy of Baal. And in our Nephilim Wars uh, Midnight Ride, we talked about the war between Baal and Mott, the god of death. And it, it goes on to say here, in the first battle between Mott and Baal, Mott rain forced the rain god to allow himself to be swallowed by Mott's huge and voracious gullet and so to enter the netherworld for a period of time but these concepts are not foreign to scripture whatever and uh, these are echoed right in the word of god in revelation chapter 6 and 8 and i looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death he was capital, D-E-A-T-H, and hell, capital H-E-L-L. -L. We're talking about two entities here, and two entities that would be released from the underworld. Hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the poor fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And this will be soon coming forth. And when it happens, I guarantee you, you're not going to miss it. Now, in the text here in Isaiah 28, verses 14 and 15, it talks about the role that these two entities, and I believe these are two that we're going to see that are going to be released when the pit is open. And boy, we've got a little text from the Dead Sea Scrolls on that for you. But we're going to see here in Isaiah 28, 14, and 15, there's a prophesied covenant that is going to be made between 
these entities and the leaders in Jerusalem. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hid ourselves. And this is the rulers of Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, Revelation 2014 says, And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire, and this is the second death. Now, in Enoch 69, 12 and 13, we're going to look at this fifth Satan named Kasdija, and it says, And the fifth was named Kasdija. This is he who showed the children of men all the wicked smitings of spirits and demons and the smitings of the embryo and the womb, that it may pass away, and the smitings of the soul, the bites of the serpent, and the smitings which befall through the noontide heat, the son of the serpent named Tabet. And this is the task of Caspiel, the chief of the oath, which he showed to the holy ones when he dwelt high above in glory. And its name is Bequa. And in this in this Satan here, we have the workings of magical workings. And there's another statement here from uh, in Nicholsburg in the commentary. It says, this angel's revelation deal at least in part with magical practices. One learns to manipulate spirits and demons to smite pregnant women and perhaps to cause attacks by serpents. And this reminds me of the ride we had just a couple weeks ago where there is actually in the American pit viper, there's a huge nerve that runs from the third eye up to the brain. And uh, people that study snakes, they believe that this could even be some kind of a spiritual element. And here again, we have this idea that these fallen entities can control reptiles and use them and manipulate them to attack people. And I think this is certainly what we see in this text. And it's done, uh, according to this text in Egypt, it's done through black magic rituals and the attacks upon pregnant women. And this is something, this is some real clues here for spiritual warfare, that this is a reality of the things that we have to deal with and the things that we want to make sure that uh, we are prayed up and that we are aware of. Now, we have a text here from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and this comes from the section of the Kims. And this is something that is just really mind-blowing to me. Uh, it's from hymn number nine. <laughs> number nine, number nine. Hymn number nine from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it says this, and there's some very, very cryptic language here. It talks about the wombs of the pit. It says, and they, the conceivers of vanity. And these conceivers of vanity, these are the entities in the fallen realm that conceive and think this stuff up. And they, the conceivers of vanity, shall be prey to terrible anguish and wombs of the pit. They shall pray to all, they shall be prey to all the works of horror. And the wombs of the pit, there are wombs down there, really? Well, according to this uh, writer, there are. He says, and the as the abysses boil and the fountains of the waters, the towering waves and billows shall rage with the voice of their roaring. And as they rage, hell and Abaddon. And once again, here we have hell and Abaddon, uh, death and hell shall open and all the flying arrows of the pit shall send out their voice to the abyss and the gates of hell shall open and on all the works of vanity 
and the doors of the pit shall close on the conceivers of wickedness, and the everlasting bars shall be bolded on all the spirits of naught. And it's just chilling to think the 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 way that this speaks of the wombs of the pit and what we see in scripture with uh, freakish creatures and chimeras coming out of the pit. Uh, it, it's just chilling to think about uh, what it's going to be like. But it's also very encouraging to know. And uh, we want to read a text here from the 10th chapter of the book of Luke. We know that these things are coming. And, and for, for all the power, and we don't want for a minute to underestimate the power of the evil one, but we want to understand clearly that these are uh, conquered and defeated at the cross, that in Christ uh, we have authority over them, and out of Christ they're going to eat our lunch. And that's just the way it is, that the Bible doesn't sugarcoat what's coming. It's going to be very, very dramatic. Colossians 2 and verse 14 it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So there was a, there was a defeat of Satan at the cross. And he really, it, it just really like says he made a clown show of these entities he defeated them and in luke chapter 10 and 18 i love the scripture too i beheld satan as lightning falling from heaven behold i give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you and just like enoch is a mortal man he was just a mortal man and yet he rebuked the fallen angels in Christ, we have that authority. We don't want to uh, rail or mock or take the power of the fallen ones lightly. But the Lord rebuke you, Satan. <laughs> and in Jesus' name, we have the authority. If Jesus, we wrestle at the right hand against principalities and powers. And if Jesus will just speak the word, these powers have to stand down. So that is the great, um, the great encouragement and the great hope that we have in Christ. Very, very true, David. Thank you so much for bringing that. And I think that it's important that people understand what's coming because there is a big deception coming on the world. And this is all going to be part of it. We're going to see things that we've heard about in movies. Um, some of us have heard about it in the Bible. Those of you that have been listening some of you have heard about it in antiquities and and really can maybe we'll be able to take this things that happen and be able to process them in a way that will not deceive you but i i would say that 99 percent of the world will be deceived by this most people don't even know that they're in a spiritual battle right now as we speak they don't realize that there are entities that are currently trying to destroy them that they can't even see and what we can do through that, just the power that we have and being able to claim that is, is pretty amazing. So, David, thank you so much. And, and all of you, listen, thank you so much. We couldn't do this without you guys, and we're so thankful for all of you that support what we do. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen so many amazing things happening in the last couple months just with growth and with people um, coming to the knowledge and, and having just a, a real awakening to the truth that is available through through the most high God. And it's just been pretty amazing. So we're thankful for all of you. Thank you guys so much. I can't say it enough. Um, with that being said, David, what else we got to do right now? We got to get everybody to hit that like button, right? Get the that pound, pounders pound, pound going like on. Button. And pound. Uh, we want to give a big thank you to all of you that support the book of Enoch commentary on the now you see TV uh, pay channel. We really appreciate that. And we're going to appreciate you doing that pounders pound to get that, uh, our loggy rhythms yeah. jacked up jack up our loggy rhythms all so at the same time here we go one, one two, two three, three boom. boom man I, I think that they hit it i think they hit that like button i could feel it all the way over here do you feel it david i'm a feeling it i'm, I'm a, feeling. a feeling them loggy rhythms jump yeah so thank you guys so much david in us out well as always we want to thank each and every one of you that um 
is a part of the Midnight Ride and support us in this work. We thank you so much, and we couldn't do what we do without you. So until next Saturday night, 10 p.m. Central, high five, and good night, everybody, from the Midnight Ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up.